We're particularly looking at how does big data participate in some of the issues around producing enough food for eventually 8 billion people and then getting that food to where it needs to be. Well, hello, everybody. And you may think of us as a UK retailer, but actually we're a global business because we source from about 72 countries around the world. Those 12,500 products are about half of our turnover and therefore their material um, to the impact that we have as an organisation. Existing data sources have become much more accurate and much more granular in the way that we can look at them and the detail in which we can look at them. So we work very closely with the Met Office on all sorts of things, um, from short term, is it going to be sunny this weekend? Because the difference for us between a sunny weekend where everyone barbecues, has burgers, sausages, chicken thighs and drumsticks and bags of salad, or whether they buy um, big, big lumps of meat and potatoes and root vegetables can be the difference of £15 million pounds over the course of a weekend. It is very easy to grow lots of asparagus in Peru and it is better to sea freight asparagus than it is to try and grow it with lots of fertilisers in a climate like the UK that isn't really meant to grow it very well. What we've done essentially is use remote sensing into those containers to manage the temperature, the humidity and the gas combinations in those containers, GPS satellite to track the container and on the basis of those time and temperature records we can predict the shelf life of that product which means that we can sell customers a better quality product with the right shelf life. We're the biggest retailer of MSC fish in the world but we also know that it's no good being the biggest retailer of MSC fish um, when 25% of the world's fish is illegally caught. Whilst you might have that piece of paper that says this is where the fish has come from, you don't really know. That is an act of faith. I can now look at satellite imagery, at the satellite catapult in Harwell. Um, when we've done this, we're using it as part of our surveillance. I can see that vessel, I can see when it went out, I can see where it fished, I can see that if it was line caught, because it will be going up and down as opposed to rounded circles, and I can see the data that it came back, and I know from what that data is clashed with in, at the port, what was unloaded uh, and what was sold on. The main challenge that we focus on in Syngenta is, is this. We're expecting... Um, an extra two billion people by 2050 and uh, all these people have to be fed. We need to explore the scientific space more effectively and we need to use new technologies to break into those silos and get that data. What we can really expect is new types of data, new shapes of data from new environments and emerging technologies. And then on the right hand side there the idea of things like uh, adaptive sensor networks. So these are networks in the field of low cost sensors that are monitoring the environment at high resolution, networks that can adapt to the environment as well and change their behavior according to that. So, you know, the reality is what we should expect in the future is very much an integrated agricultural approach. So here's some, an example from HGCA on control of black grass. And you can see that the occurrence of black grass declines as they apply each of these different pieces of agro agronomic operation. We have to understand what is the appropriate ag agronomic approach to apply to the environment that we're actually in. And HGCA make this point in that they actually say, well, that blueprint that you've just seen there isn't actually a blueprint for every single field. You have to adjust it according to every farm field that you go to. In some respects, you need to really understand the environment that you're operating in so that you can apply the right integrated agricultural approach. Wouldn't it be great if we really understood the microenvironment around every single individual plant and we could actually make some useful decisions for the farmer based on that. This is kind of like personalized healthcare, but for, for each individual plant. So if you want to build an integrated solution that can provide that kind of level of service to a grower, you have to understand how data available that's so much more than just crop protection or genomic data. This sums up for me what I believe is one of our biggest challenges, and it's how do we integrate data so that we can deliver integrated solutions. I don't think that any private organization, uh, any single company is going to be able to solve this. This is only going to be done through uh, really quite a community-based approach. It isn't one science anymore that is going to answer the questions. 
it is all of the disciplines coming together and working in an integrated way. Some of the expense and the research and development and investment might have to go into one part of the value chain, which is a, a true investment, but the benefit is seen in another part of the value chain. To me, the challenge here is it's about how the language of the data is not proprietary, it's an open space so everybody can use it. That's what needs to happen to really make this work. And, and, and while that's not happened, this can only ever move forwards with collaborations and partnerships, which I think probably turn out to be quite expensive because you're going through that integration cycle on every single one of them. You would think that we are very sophisticated in terms of um, managing the demand side of our business. We will look at algorithms, we'll look at when Christmas fell on a Thursday, how many years ago, and what was the weather like on that Thursday versus the Thursday previous, when the weather was, it was snowing, and, and, and we'd be be very sophisticated in creating that demand. What we're not so sophisticated is connecting um, that to the supply. We had a project two years ago where we were making predictions about sclerotinia outbreak in oil seed rape. So it's a great piece of work, developing a new sensor for it, uh, nodes for those go into fields. Now the thing is, if you want to make a prediction about sclerotinia outbreak, the presence of a sclerotinia spore is not enough. And as you add these extra factors in, what you're doing is you put layers and layers of technology in which you need to kind of fund and find a way of using so that you can uh, make, it, make a prediction. I think there's a whole new world of it to come. So in a total risk assessment, um, we will be looking at all of those ge geopolitical issues, food security issues, um, those predictions alongside the sort of hard tangible data around climate change, weather patterns. When you do that, about 90% of the world goes red. <laughs> so um, I say in our business, when you look at our global risk map, um, that's very red. Our job is then to find the data that enables us to get shades of red. I think there's some real opportunities for data to drive um, policy around biodiversity on farms. Wouldn't it be good if data on things like pesticide resistance was opened up and shared um, in, in, a, in a standard way so that groups of companies could get together and sort out what, how they're going to respond to those kind of things around the world. I suspect that, that all of those things are around creating equitable value chains where everyone sees the value of them because that's what brings overall stability. There are some really exciting things happening um, that I don't even think I could have imagined um, let alone dreamt of even 10 years ago. Well, can I ask you to thank our speakers once again?